In 1906, President Teddy Roosevelt created the nation's first national monument designation. The purpose of this designation was to preserve for all Americans significant pieces of the country's history, ecology, geology, and beauty. All national monuments are designated by U.S. presidents and are chosen as their personal memorials of those most special parts of this great country. Memorials that they see a need to protect over all others. Some are big, some are small. Some garner large budgets and staff. Others, next to none. All were chosen by presidents who considered them the most important places to protect over all other places in the country. America's national monuments tell the story of the nation's past and present glory. Hello, I'm Jordan Murphy. And I'll be your guide as we visit 12 national monuments located in America's southern states and territories. In this program, I'll show you the ruins of prehistoric cities rivaling any in the ancient world. They were built by Native American cultures living here in the South. It's a largely unknown story, and it's a story you can learn by traveling to the region's three national monuments devoted to prehistory. Archaeologists are only now realizing the true engineering wonder that is Poverty Point National Monument. It's the oldest city on the North American continent. Springtime comes to the lower Mississippi River Valley. The Mississippi Delta Flatlands A chorus of birds heralds a new beginning. Ephemeral spring wildflowers are in full bloom below the emerging tree canopy. Purple violets. Miniature forests like May apples. Stately trilliums. The curious jack-in-the-pulpits and fields of flocks. At this time of the year, there are a hundred shades of green, not the uniformity of summer's full foliage. A battered luna moth slowly dies after mating. At this place in present-day Louisiana, once stood the oldest city in North America. Established in 1988 by President Ronald Reagan, this site is now called Poverty Point National Monument. Although part of the National Monument system, it is administered by the state of Louisiana. Within the monument are the remains of the only city the world has ever seen built by a hunter-gatherer culture. At the center of the city was the Great Bird Mound, a staircase leads to the top. From this vantage point, one can see the many trees and shrubs that are in full bloom. On all sides, smaller earthen mounds are visible. To the west are six semicircular concentric terraces. On the terraces were the homes of this once magnificent city. Homes that might have looked like this. How many? I think uh, once you try to evenly do some spatial patterning out there, you're probably looking at five to six hundred homes that would very easily fall in here. With a population maybe a thousand to two thousand at, uh, at its highest point. 
On the grounds of the monument is a visitor center containing some of the artworks of this mysterious culture whose people were living at the time Stonehenge was reaching its completion. Here there are many objects of art and decoration that reveal a remarkable artistic sensibility. Who were these people who were able to do what no other hunter-gatherer culture has ever been able to do? Build a city that lasted for over 500 years. This is the mystery and wonder of Poverty Point National Monument. Sometime around 5,000 years ago, a group of Native American people, known today as the Poverty Point culture, lived along the lower Mississippi River and developed a unique ethnographic identity. They hunted upland game such as deer with stone-tipped spears hurled by an atlatl, a device that looked like this. They fished the adjacent rivers and lagoons. We know this from the beautiful plummets used to lure their nets and they gathered roots from the plants growing in the nearby swamps. Then these hunter-gatherers embarked on something never done before. They figured out how to build a city, a city built according to a master blueprint. So they're choosing this spot. Again, it all comes back to food. For me, the story is, is how they sustain themselves. Uh, and in an abundance when you consider the massive earthworks because these folks weren't just sitting around taking it easy. You know, they're moving probably a million cubic yards of earth out here, which is a, a core of engineer size project. So there has to be enough within this environment to fuel that, that kind of an economy and, and corporate, you know, work that they're doing. The scale of what these people did was staggering. The city was formed by six concentric earthen embankments that now stand six feet high and are 140 to 200 feet apart. They are separated by ditches or swales where the earth was removed to build ridges. From end to end, the outermost terrace is 4,000 feet in length, the inner nearly 2,000 feet. The terraces are divided into six sectors by five cross-cutting aisles or corridors. In the middle is a vast central plaza. Surrounding the terraces are five earthen mounds, including the giant bird mound. Centrally placed, the bird mound is over 75 feet high. From head to tail, it is 710 feet long and from wingtip to wingtip, 640 feet. When archaeologists took aerial photos, what they saw were clearly the remains of a city built of earth. It just didn't seem possible. Throughout all of human history, advanced agriculture had always been necessary for cultures to move from nomadic to urban societies. Diana Greenlee has been studying Poverty Point. When archaeologists first uh, came here and started doing some excavations and they discovered how large it is and um, just how amazing it is, they initially assumed that it had to be farmers because in their experience they had not come across hunter-gatherers who could do or who did this sort of thing. And it wasn't until they actually started looking at the subsistence remains that it became clear that these were not farmers. It's just really amazing that um, a group of hunter-gatherers could construct all of this in a relatively short period of time. And it has uh, really challenged anthropologists' assumptions about hunter-gatherer uh, society and what they can accomplish. 
Although no burial remains of the Poverty Point people have ever been found, many trade goods from thousands of miles away have been unearthed. This was clearly a trade center of great power existing in North America long before the birth of Christ. In addition to these trade goods, many small objects of art have been found. Beads, pendants in various geometric and animal shapes, hundreds of small decorative ball objects, effigies and drawings of cats and owls a fine collection of spear points, and most remarkably, small female figures baked from clay. Poverty Point National Monument truly is one of the great wonders of the ancient world. However, that this city is found on the delta of North America's greatest river, the Mississippi River, is not a surprise as many of the world's early civilizations were located on river deltas. Poverty Point National Monument is situated in a large geological system called a coastal plain. A coastal plain is defined as a low relief region of largely undisturbed sedimentary strata that dip gently in the seaward direction. Such areas generally have well-developed drainage systems. The Gulf Coast Coastal Plain, which extends from the Florida Panhandle to Texas, is influenced by the Appalachian and Ozark Mountain ranges. At the time of the Poverty Point people, this coastal plain was dominated by prairie grasses, but were in time replaced by the hard and softwood forests seen here today. A unique feature of the coastal plain is the Mississippi River embayment. It represents a break in the former continuous Appalachian mountain chain. When the supercontinent of Pangaea pulled apart 95 million years ago, it created a tectonically active rift valley. That valley is where the Mississippi River flows today. It is the most important continental drainage system in the United States. Indeed, all rivers east of the Rockies and west of the Appalachians flow into the Mississippi River. Nearing the Gulf of Mexico, the river flow slows, dropping vast amounts of sediments in a plumed-shaped formation called the delta. The delta is characterized by shallow tributaries and swamps. It was along the banks of the Mississippi River near the delta that the Poverty Point people chose to build their fabulous ancient city. But don't expect to see the Mississippi River near the ancient city today, as the Mississippi's channel and delta are ever-changing. Caves have always been sacred places for ancient cultures. The one here at Russell Cave National Monument in northern Alabama is no exception. Here, there's a record of over 8,000 years of continuous occupation. The monument's sign marks the entrance to the most unique archaeological site on the North American continent. Russell Cave National Monument is tucked among the woods and rugged hillsides of the southern Appalachian Mountains in northern Alabama. It is part of the forested Cumberland Plateau. Here loblolly pines soar skyward. 
Here, rapidly dropping streams and rivers begin their journey south to the Atlantic Ocean. Here, the uplifted ancient rock strata are carved by those waters into canyons, waterfalls, and caves. Immediately upon entering the monument, one encounters Dry Creek, a seasonal stream that in the spring courses with rushing meltwater from the higher mountain peaks to the north. But now in the fall, it is dry except for the occasional quiet pond. All along its banks, evidence of those torrents of rushing water are revealed by exposed tree roots gripping the shoreline. Dry Creek is a signpost, a roadway for over 9,000 years of Native American inhabitants of the region. A roadway home. The creek leads through the forest to massive rock bluffs. Home is near. Then a giant sinkhole. Below, chickadees flitter about. Only a few hundred more yards. Now the bubble of clear, fresh water. Spring water. And then the welcoming rock shelter. Home and witness to every prehistoric Native American culture that lived in the region. Designated a national monument by President John F. Kennedy in 1961, today it is known as Russell Cave. Walking along the boardwalk that now leads to the cave is park ranger Larry Bean. There's also the spring that's right in front of the cave, and this spring is a part that actually played a big part in making people come to Russell Cave. They had a shelter, they had a spring, and it was along a path where they could find it if they followed the creek. Indeed, Russell Cave contains the longest record of continuous human habitation in the U.S. Inside today, there is a reconstruction of some early cave residents. There is a magical feeling standing inside this cave, looking out as thousands had done before. It's a feeling of being in a protective womb. The cave is constantly changing. The cave itself has the condensation of the moisture on the rocks on a cool day. Uh, the rocks cool off and on a warm day with the high humidity, the rocks condense moisture like a cold drink and that moisture will run to the low points and come to a drip mark and that makes the drip marks in the floor. The droplets that hang there for a long time, and especially the ones that may seep through the limestone and pick up lime, they actually pick up enough calcium to hang there and evaporate and leave a little bit there, and those formations form over a long time period. The drip marks are only the latest stage in the cave's long geological history. Russell Cave is carved out of cliff-forming rock of the Mississippian Age. 350 million years ago, the area was covered by ocean. As sediments settled to the bottom, they eventually consolidated into rock. Then, as the continents collided, mountain building began. And as this area was uplifted, the southern Appalachians actually in this area was uplifted fairly flatly and then after the collision with Africa there was a lot of overthrust belts uh, to the east and Sand Mountain and Lookout Mountain, uh, both of them on the other side of the Tennessee River, are re really flat lying plateaus that are part of the Cumberland Plateau. The area in the higher part of the southern Appalachians was actually uplifted and crumpled and pushed up into more mountainous areas. In time, 
the solid limestone developed cracks, and water found its way into those cracks. The water slowly dissolved and eroded away the rock, forming caverns. The erosion process here at Russell Cave was greatly accelerated when the last ice sheet retreated, sending huge amounts of meltwater rushing down Dry Creek into the labyrinth of caverns. Then sometime around 10,000 years ago, the roof of the cave collapsed right here, creating this giant sinkhole, which is visible in front of the present-day cave entrance. This event revealed the current entrance to Russell Cave. From then on, a continuous stream of sediments buried the remains of thousands of years of human occupation. Russell Cave's uh, depth, the sediment brought in by Dry Creek, Dry Creek brought in enough sediment to make layer after layer story of Russell Cave. And the archeological record from the Smithsonian excavation is 43 feet. 43 feet, the height of a four-story building preserving over 9,000 years of human history. In 1953, a trail of Native American artifacts led to a cave hidden in the forested area, adjacent to a farmer's field in northern Alabama. What archaeologists from the Smithsonian Institute found in the cave was a treasure trove of artifacts dating back some 8,000 years. They found spear points, tools, and bone fragments from each of the successive Native American cultures, beginning with the mammoth hunting Paleo-Indians. These nomadic hunters were replaced by the people of the Archaic Period. The Archaic Period at Russell Cave contains almost every culture from around eight or 9,000 years ago up till the Woodland Period. And those people left in here some of the earliest bone fish hooks in the southeast, some of the earliest weaving textile impressions in the cave floor. It's actually a woven mat or basket that was impressed into the cave floor. Several pieces of that was excavated. The earliest human remains in Alabama came from Russell Cave. The archaic hunters were experts at using the atlatl a device engineered to throw a spear accurately over great distances. Russell Cave Ranger Larry Bean demonstrates how the atlatl works. This is a, a cane spear. The river cane was a native plant that was used in the southeast, at least in the later time periods. We don't know what all the spears were made out of, and many of them probably were made out of hardwood. But at Russell Cave, they had reloadable spears and they had a four shaft main shaft where they could clip them together. And the way the atlatl works is uh, at Russell Cave, they found deer antler hooks, deer antler handles, and stone weights. Now I have one of the simplest atlatls you can make. It's a uh, fork on a stick, and you just sharpen one end so that it fits into the bottom of the spear. You take that and use that as an extra leverage so that hook actually launches your spear and gives you a longer arm and more leverage. About 2,000 years ago, agriculture, particularly the growing of corn, made its way into the southeastern United States. From this practice, a new culture developed. It was called the woodland culture. At Russell Cave, the woodland period begins with the advent of farming, uh, bows and arrows, pottery, uh, not necessarily in that order, but the people's culture changed and they started developing uh, a group organization. And they still use the cave extensively here, sort of like it was too good of a home to pass up. 
Uh, they had uh, storage pits in the woodland period fairly extensively. The pottery here, we have over 13,000 pot sherds, which are, they range from the size of a dime on that, probably. Uh, many of the cultures of the woodland period, almost all of them are represented here. The last prehistoric period here was the Mississippian, the time of the great walled cities and ceremonial mounds. But by this time, Russell Cave was only visited by the occasional traveler. Still nowhere else tells us more about the early Native American people who occupied the historic South for over 12,000 years. Better than Russell Cave. The doorway behind me leads to a ceremonial room that was once part of a great Mississippian city located in Georgia's Okmulgee National Monument. The city was part of a network of spectacular pre-Columbian cities that spanned the entire eastern half of the United States. Rivers that begin as raging torrents pouring out of the Appalachian mountain chain suddenly slow. These rivers, such as the Okmulgee, have just crossed the dominant geographical feature in the Old South, the Fall Line. Now turtles sun themselves on sandbars as the rivers continue their leisurely journey to the Atlantic. After an evening storm, Walnut Creek, swollen with the red clay that Georgia is known for, empties into the Okmulgee. Nowhere in the south is the fall line, the division between the rolling hills of the Piedmont to the north and the coastal plain to the south, better represented than at Okmulgee National Monument. Here is one place where the last vestiges of the hardwood forests to the north and the beginning of the famous southern swamps can be found in one place. It is where the semi-tropics begin. Here, every little nook is a new microenvironment. The edge of a pond. The bark of a tree. A fallen log. Here at Okmulgee National Monument, a newly constructed boardwalk carries the visitor across one edge of the emerging swamp. Okmulgee was designated a monument in 1936 by President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Okmulgee is more than just a wonderful ecotone. An imposing mound towers over the swamp's bottomlands. It's called the Great Temple Mound. Okmulgee National Monument also preserves what was once an ancient city. We are in the middle of a large village. Back then, I think it would have easily been judged to be a city. Two to three thousand people living in this immediate vicinity. And from this, we can learn a lot about how they were organized socially. How were their buildings arranged in groupings? How, what was the relationship of the houses compared to spiritual places and political and social gathering places? One of those special places is a reconstructed earthen lodge, the ceremonial building where the ancient city's people and spiritual leaders met to conduct business and perform religious ceremonies. Inside, a large bird effigy was carved into the lodge's 1,000-year-old floor. The people that lived here were part of the Mississippian culture that formed a vast interconnected network of cities, spanning the entire eastern half of the United States. Inside the visitor center at Okmulgee National Monument survives one of the finest collections of Mississippian pottery. A particularly prized piece is called Little Boy. 
It is not surprising that these Mississippians built their city here on the banks of the Okmulgee River. All Mississippian cities were built on rivers. In particular, the people living here must have been able to exploit the rich biodiversity of the ecotone. We now know that the Mississippians were as advanced as any civilization in the Americas at that time. Around 700 AD, a remarkable transformation took place in the eastern half of the United States. Stephen Rudolph has been studying this change in the Native American economy. The Mississippians showed up around the year 900 and they arrived with a different cultural idea. Agriculture as a main function of the society. Corn, beans and squash, the three sisters. Those three agricultural products change a culture dramatically. They allow your children to grow up more healthy. They allow the older folks to live more successfully and pass on the knowledge they've gained. And it becomes a dependence on that agriculture, which is generally an advantage to the society. We also find a trade network that comes with these Mississippian people that extends throughout much of this part of the country. And so we look at that as an idea rather than a simple idea, a very complex idea. The people who are here were part of a much larger society that stretched up and down the entire Mississippi all the way to the coast. This remarkable network of cities could almost be viewed as a trade empire. Its capital, called Cahokia, was a city of over 20,000 inhabitants near present-day St. Louis. A typical Mississippian city looked something like this. Laid out as a rectangle, the cities were usually walled. Outside of the palisades were the agricultural areas. Unlike European cities, at the center was a large open space, common grounds where games could be played. On one side of the open space were the living quarters of the average citizen. The other side was reserved for the elite ruling and religious classes. Finally, every city had a number of large pyramidal, ceremonial, and burial mounds. Structures that if they had been made of stone, would have been among the great wonders of the ancient world. We now know something of how these people looked. They drew themselves on seashells, at Okmulgee National Monument, archaeologists have reproduced a number of these drawings on a backlit glass screen. At about the time the Europeans arrived in the New World, all the great civilizations of North America were in decline. Still, when Hernando de Soto on his journey of discovery in 1539 encountered Mississippian cities, he described them as urban complexes of incomparable splendor. His descriptions were thought to be pure fancy. We're just beginning to understand the remarkable accomplishments of the Mississippian people. Two of the geological provinces of America's Old South are represented at Okmulgee National Monument. What we're here on is the edge of the Piedmont. This is actually the toes of the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains. Piedmont is foot mountains in French, and it's actually the toes. Here's where it ends and the coastal floodplains begin. Uh, and in ancient times, this was the edge of the ocean. All of the South's topography and climates are influenced by the Appalachian mountain chain. 300 million years ago, the birth of the Appalachians took place as a result of the continental collisions that resulted in the formation of the supercontinent, Pangaea. 
Today, the Appalachians are a highly eroded old mountain system. At its core are the Blue Ridge Mountains. Here, thrusting into a smoky blue sky, are the Appalachians' highest peaks. Peaks composed of sea sediments from the Paleozoic era. Driving south and dropping lower, one encounters the Piedmont geological region, characterized by rolling hills composed of metamorphic sea sediments and igneous rocks rich in feldspars. Feldspars, when weathered, produce the famous red soils that are particularly prevalent in central Georgia near Okmulgee National Monument. Then the Piedmont drops off into three large coastal plains. The Northern Coastal Plain, the Southern Coastal Plain, and the Gulf Coastal Plain. Walking across this remarkable fall line, the boundary between the Piedmont and the Southern Coastal Plain, one experiences what makes Okmulgee National Monument such a special place. A pivotal point of geology, ecology, and ancient history. Thanks for joining me on our trip through the Southern Prehistoric National Monuments. I'm Jordan Murphy.